Hey. Yo. Been playing a lot of Final Fantasy XIV lately. I just didn't ask. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's pretty good. Been thinking about maybe making some sort of review on it. You know, just a collection of my thoughts, put it up on the channel. I think that could be pretty good. What are you going to call it? Final Fantasy XIV review? Come on, no one's just going to click on that. you got to think of a unique approach if you're going to do this. Unique approach, you say? <laughs> Here's a quirky little fact about myself, I've been playing World of Warcraft since I was 8 years old. Through that game, I've had some truly great and unforgettable experiences. Made online friends I still talk to 10 years later, got cutting edge twice, even went to a guild gathering in London to meet the people from my raid team, and a slew of other things which has made this game so special to me over the years. Recently, however, it's been rather unanimously agreed upon that the game's sort of taken a turn for the worse, to the point where the most anticipated piece of content in recent memory was literally just them undoing 17 years of updates. And so for their newest expansion, Shadowlands, Blizzard rethought their plan and reallocated a large amount of their resources to provide the best possible experience for all. Sadly, however, as it turns out, spending your entire game budget on in-house lactation chambers, surveillance cameras for the female bathroom, and a giant framed picture of Bill Cosby, look it up, doesn't really make the game any better, and so through a mix of the employees being a bunch of party rockers and the game just kind of being shit, not only did a large percentage of WoW players quit, but it's gotten so bad that majority of World of Warcraft content creators, people who have their livelihood and financial stability tied to WoW, decided that potentially being thrown out on the street is preferable to playing the game. And no matter where you look in the community as of late, all you hear is just Hula Bula It's Preacher! Game's kinda shit at the moment, yeah? Hey guys, Matt Season here. I just wanted to let you all know that I'm quitting the game. Well, you know, I just don't think that WoW's in a very good spot right now. With the various systems and internal affairs really coming together to just make it a not fun experience to boot up the game. Definitely. Absolutely. The worst part is that we have no idea how my blade, Michael. It thirsts. It hungers for blood. Mr. Manson, people are quitting in mass. More allegations of gender discrimination are coming out by the hour. One woman even killed herself after the company's treatment of her. Please say, say something in your defense. Oh boy, that's not good. Oh yeah, no, wait, 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 I have an idea. Okay, yeah, come over here. Sometimes whenever you've done something wrong, there's nothing you can do but just offer a genuine apology. Sorry for party rocking. But when the company is on fire, the employees are too busy molesting their female co-workers to do anything about it, and the game is so bad that even Aspengold doesn't want to play it, where do a metric shit ton of WoW players go? Well, Final Fantasy, apparently. Final Fantasy XIV is an MMORPG originally released in 2010 and was, upon release, notoriously a shit game. So to fix it up, developer Square Enix called in game director Yoshi P and fix it he did, effectively remaking the entire game from the ground up by making a Realm Reborn, after which he kept spearheading expansions for the game, each of which somehow always turned out better than the last. And this has culminated in the game now having a 10 year backlog of both story and content for any new player to explore, and excited at the prospect of throwing away over 300 hours of my life, I gathered a few of my friends and we got ready to set out. But before we start our journey through Eorzea, we first need to make our characters. And as any seasoned MMO player will tell you, there are a grand total of two ways to go about this. You either sit down and meticulously craft an idealized version of yourself, someone you can look at and think, this is a reflection of myself and what I want to be in this game. Which then further allows you to get engaged in the story and feel the various narrative beats on a more personal level as you can fully immerse yourself in the fantasy of living in the world that you are playing in. Or you make the character you want to fuck the most. Obviously, we all went for the latter. And I gotta tell you, with a great variety of races, there's really just some for everyone here. Personally, I play a Mikate because I recently finished up Nekopara, Mark plays a Rogadin because he keeps catcalling female bodybuilders and hopes that they'll punch him in the face, Peer plays an Aura because he shops at Bad Dragon, and Kurt, well, yeah, let, let, let's not get too into that. But now we've picked our races, we've customized our waifu, our class has been chosen, meaning we can finally log in, and we get to experience the gameplay.
it's kind of shit. Okay, so let me just clarify quick. There are some genuinely interesting mechanics and complex rotations befitting the tap target playstyle once you get to the end game. With a combat system that really makes it feel like moment to moment decisions you make matter a lot. And with a skill ceiling to boot, so you always feel like there's something you can improve upon on any given boss. And I think a nice example of this can be found in just looking at the player data or locks from the most recent raid. Here we find that the absolute worst DPS in the game you can potentially bring along with you is a black mage. However, if you go and look at the top of the meters for the very best players, the class with the highest potential output is a black mage. And this ability to become better at your class and abuse his mechanics to the utmost to just do some absolutely nutty stuff really is what makes something as mundane seeming as tap targeting work as a combat system. But that's all in the end game, and before we get there, we first have to go through the entire 300 hour story, most of which you're way below max level for. And in terms of gameplay, it is... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is... Yeah, it is not good. The game doesn't just assume that this is your first time playing an MMO, it treats you as though you've never touched the computer before in your life. Let's take the Lancer as an example. You start with True Thrust at level 1, then at level 4 you learn Vorpal Thrust, which combos with the previous, meaning you now have a very basic 1-2 combo. Now, realistically, the next two abilities you get that influence your actual rotation are at level 18, where you get a buff, and level 26, where you get the third hit for your now 1-2-3 combo. After which you hit level 30 and your interesting skills sort of start being drip fed to you at 5 level intervals, but until then, hope you enjoy pressing 1-2 repeatedly while watching Netflix on your secondary monitor, because that's what you're doing for the next 12 hours. And that's even one of the better examples, try leveling something like a white mage in solo content. Aside from your dot, you have one damaging ability. When do you get your second? No. Okay, I guess technically you get holy at level 45, but that's an AoE, and frankly, more of an attack on your 2020 eyesight than any enemy. Still not convinced? Let me tell you about macros. A macro is a custom button that you can set up to do anything in your inventory or spellbook. So if you for example want to drink a potion to increase your damage whenever you activate your burst, you can make a macro to do so in a single button press. Final Fantasy, however, decided to also let you put a delay into your macros, meaning that you can queue up several abilities with the press of a single button. And combining this with a way too simple early game rotation meant that on my Dark Knight, which was the first character I leveled, until level 62, which is well over 100 hours into the game, mind you, my entire rotation was bound to a single button, meaning my gameplay effectively just ended up looking like this. What's up, gentlemen? So today we are talking about the newest addition to the social hierarchy pyramid, which is the elusive Sigma Male. And it's sad because there is some genuinely interesting gameplay to be had once you have your full kit unlocked, but being kept from it for seemingly no reason other than the game just refusing to give you skills before they were canonically introduced in the expansion cycle, like a bad hand job, that rubbed me the wrong way. With that said, though, outside of combat and content you'd expect, like dungeons and raids, which all range from decent to phenomenal outside of like the first three, there's a lot of elements that are just there because they're fun or add flavor, and it's also a big part of what kept me going through the initial stages of the game to get to the actual good stuff later on. A giant casino with chocobo racing and tons of minigames, in-game concerts hosted by players, the ability to get married, a collectible and playable card game inside the game, random jumping puzzles around the world, fully supported and customizable player housing. None of these have an impact on the actual gameplay, but people do them anyways because they're just fun or add to the world. Take fishing for example. I have no fucking idea what you use fish for in this game. Genuinely, couldn't tell you at gunpoint. Nevertheless, I'm fishing level 71 and probably have about 10% of my time in game spent fishing. Why? Because it's chill. There's a little boat that goes out every two hours with like 24 people and it's great fun to just go out with my friends and compare penis size in the form of our fishing score while chatting shit. One time I even managed to get 10,000 fish point and I got a sick shark mount for it, which became one of my favorites for uh, reasons. <coughs> And these various systems and types of moments really are what help make the game feel like a living, breathing world as opposed to just a glorified dungeon hub. There's players everywhere, doing stuff, sometimes progressing and other times just hanging out. Occasionally, you'll stumble upon a location only to discover that some guy decides to throw an impromptu boat party there. At this point, about 200 people have gathered just to have an in-game party for no other reason than the fact it seemed like a cool thing to do and because real clubs are scary. And the best part is that all these things are available to the average player right off the bat, helping sell them on the world and community as they can jump right into the various systems without having to go through a 50 hour handholding session first. And while some like housing might seem a tad expensive at first, trust me. You go sit idle and limsy lumsa on a female character in a somewhat skimpy attire for a couple hours and respond with a winky face whenever one of those big 
furry fellow sent you a personal tell, you can easily make those two to three million in about three hours of good, honest work. Because as my favorite Twitch streamer always says, Never stop sucking big dick? Wait, what the fuck? That's not what it says. And extending a helping hand to new players is not just limited to the erotic roleplay community either. Everyone I've met in this game has actually just been so friendly that initially I thought there was some sort of hidden Reddit karma system coercing them to act this way, but no. For whatever reason, and you'll hear this echo from basically everyone who's tried the game, the people who play it are just chill and welcoming. Whenever I've stood in a major city and looked at someone for more than five seconds, nine out of ten times, they would stop up, give me a hug, and ask me how my day's been. It's almost uncanny how friendly people are in this game, unlike anything I've ever experienced before. And honestly, it's just such a pleasure having these small interactions littered throughout your gameplay. In your heart, aren't you just describing people displaying basic human decency and not being assholes? Does average human behavior really warrant such praise? Excuse me? Have you ever actually played an online game? Last time I booted up Apex Legends, someone called me the N-word and leaked my IP address. And we were still in the lobby. The hardest part about League of Legends isn't playing a match, it's finding four other people that are mentally stable enough to stay for the duration of it. A summoner has disconnected. But that's just not a thing in Final Fantasy, as the game's non-competitive nature and years of fostering a genuine community has meant that people are just there to have a good time and are, for the most part, open to let you in on that sense of community, despite how good or bad you might be at the game itself. Heck, for a lot of people, the actual endgame they participate in basically just involves putting on some cute clothes, taking pictures of it, and partaking in the various side systems I mentioned earlier. And I think a large part of the reason the community surrounding Final Fantasy is so friendly is, unironically, because the largest and biggest draw of the game isn't anything so competitive as high-level PvP or even endgame PvE content but rather, the story. The story in Final Fantasy XIV is actually just so fucking good. Yoshi P took a pretty big gamble and effectively forced every new player to play through everything in it before getting to the end game, which is usually where the focus of an MMO lies, but by god am I glad he did. Everything in the story is just a big interconnected network of events, which keeps bringing up and building upon previous plot points. However, this also means that if you hadn't pushed through the somewhat slower and less interesting build-up stories from the base game, a lot of the stuff later on just wouldn't make any sense. And you'd be hard-pressed to find a person who's played through the entire thing and didn't love the absolute shit out of it, but when talking about a time investment this big, it's hard to know whether whether or not that's because it's actually universally good, or because of survivorship bias, or, as I like to call it, the One Piece effect. No one has watched every single episode of One Piece and wouldn't recommend you the show, but is that because it's actually good, or because the only people willing to sit through a thousand episodes of it are the same ones who liked it in the first place? And it's the same with Final Fantasy. You won't meet a person who's played through the entirety of it and won't gush about the story, myself included, but for the people that never make it that far and just kind of leave with a somewhat lukewarm experience during some of the admittedly worse earlier content, it's hard to say whether or not they would have started to enjoy it had they just stuck with it. It. And even so, while I think there's some genuinely amazing narrative to be experienced through it, with the latest expansion Shadowbringers quite literally just being what I would call peak fiction, I also can't expect everyone to be as eager as me to waste two weeks worth of free time just to start experiencing it. What I will say though is that when this game tries to deliver a big story moment, I have yet to experience it not absolutely just hit it out of the park, bringing together music, visuals, and even utilizing the shortcomings of the MMO genre itself to its own advantage. For example, during the start of the Heavensward expansion, uh, spoilers for Heavensward by the way, during the start of the Heavensward expansion, you're told about Nithawk a great worm who's waged a thousand year war with the people of Ishgard, seemingly out of nothing but his pure, unfounded hatred for mankind, and so being the warrior of light, you set off to kill him. However, as you start making your way towards him, you slowly uncover more pieces of the dragon's past, and learn that rather than some chaotic evil dragon lord, Nidhogg's story is more akin to that of a beautiful and peaceful being, having been utterly consumed by rage after humanity betrayed him and his kin thousands of years ago, in a story forgotten to all but them, as the human leaders lured his sister into an ambush, after which they killed her to take the source of the great worm's power, namely, her eyes. And every time you uncover a piece or learn something new in regards to the origin of the dragons, you hear this instrumental track called Dragon Song play in the background. However, in spite of your newfound knowledge regarding Nidhogg, you find that his rage is simply too insurmountable to be overcome, and with his sole driving force being the endless torment of the Danish inch of Ishgard, you now have to put him out of his misery. When you finally do battle him, his brute brother Freysvalga agrees to help you fight his enraged brother, but while the two fight, it proves that Nidhogg is slightly faster, slightly stronger, and eventually knocks his brother to the ground. However, as he holds him down and declares his victory, Freysvalga Grace Falco reveals his true plan. offer you one of his eyes in an effort to empower you such that you might take on Nidhogg, a transfer of power that no dragon has ever granted a mortal before. And as you walk into his eye, absorbing part of the dragon's essence, you hear that ever familiar tune start to play, but this time, it's different. Children of the land, do you hear? There's lyrics. 
Having become one with part of the dragon, you now hear the full meaning of the dragon zone, as it blasts in the background and tells the story of not only the betrayal, but also friendship that once was between man and dragon, a bond broken by the humans which twisted Nidhogg into the spiteful being now standing before you. However, despite the fault line elsewhere, you know that he must be put down, and so you stand at alert and ready your weapon to fight him. The cutscene ends, and in front of you stands Nidhogg as the lyrical version of the dragon song plays in the background, under the tune of which you now get a solid few minutes to take in what exactly you're about to do, as you wait for the cue to pop for the fight where you can then finally take on Nidhogg and put an end to the dragon song war. Obviously, I'm not doing a 50 hour story justice by rephrasing it in a couple of paragraphs, but this is just one moment for the first expansion in which they managed to not only deliver on a big story moment, but made the act of queuing up and literally just waiting a part of that experience, something I've never experienced done before, and this is just one such instance in a much grander narrative, the total sum of which helps cement Final Fantasy XIV as one of the best stories I've ever experienced in a video game to date. But should you fat to it? Before I ever booted up Final Fantasy XIV for the first time, I stumbled upon a character from the game named Angelise Rider, a character who just so happened to have an ungodly amount of, shall we say, adult fan art attached to her name. And seeing this two meter tall ashen haired Galleon princess get plowed in every position under the sun by various farm animals got me thinking, damn. Maybe I should try out Final Fantasy. And so, mostly attributed to my Akuma mentality, I gave the game a shot, only to discover about 300 hours of playtime later that Angelis Ryder is in fact not a character in the lore, but rather someone so see who's commissioned several hundred pieces of hentai of her. You heard that right. The reason I started playing this game was to meet a character that doesn't exist in the canon. Nevertheless, I ended up having a pretty good time with it anyways, and meeting a ton of actual canon characters on the way, each of which turned out to have a very similar Rule 34 count to that of Best Girl Angelise. I also found that one of my favorite artists, Devil HS, has made not one, but two full-length comics centered around the game, both of which I must confess to enjoying quite a bit. And the fan creations don't stop at just fan art either. You can even spice up the game itself with some highly illegal third-party add-ons. Don't think the titty slider goes up quite far enough on the bunny girls? Got you covered. Wish your characters could dress off down to a little less than their underwear? You know it. Think Lala's could do with being a little more sexualized as opposed to just looking like potatoes? <laughs> you Motherfucker! Should you fab to Final Fantasy 14? Yes. yes.